Paul actually already gave me an introduction to my topic, because I'll be talking about attunement relations on distributions. And uh, what Bob said, that it's, this is not possible to do on practice basis, I kind of disagree, which is what this talk will be about. Um, so we already talked a bit about what entailment and disambiguation is. Well, entailment means that one, when you have a sentence like dog bites cat, then this implies a sentence like animal bites cat. And of course this is not the other way around. This is a fundamentally empty, uh, asymmetric relation. And the way I look at this is really that um, the reason why this entails that sentence is because dog contains strictly more information than animal and also has comparable information to this. And um, the related thing is this ambiguation where you could say that uh, bank could mean river bank or investment bank. Then you also say that these words, which, which are um, less ambiguous versions than bank, means that these words contain strictly more information. And again, with word cut, cut of a movie or type of food, again, these words contain more information. So that is the kind of, <coughs> what, kind of what, what we'll be looking at here in this talk, is this information content and how you can represent this on distributions. And um, if you see like these properties, they are reflexive, that uh, anything, anything entails itself. It's a not symmetric relation, and it's transitive. And I put a star there because you could also be talking about uh, partial entailment, um, and then, tra then transitivity becomes a bit wonky. But in this case, we'll be talking about like actual complete entailment. Um, so this kind of points towards um, trying to use a, a partial order. And we also want this to be related to information content. So um, we'll be looking at uh, trying to find a partial order on distributions that captures this idea of information content. Okay. So. Uh, I'll be looking at an information ordering, which is just a partial order with uh, suitable information-like properties. Now, just so that we're all on the same page, a partial order has the following uh, properties. So it's reflexive, anything is, um, I'll, I'll just say, uh, smaller than in this context for this symbol. So we say that x is always smaller than x, and if x is smaller than y, and y is smaller than z, then x is smaller than z, it's transitivity. And anti-symmetric means that the direction only goes in one way. You can't have that x is smaller than y, and y is smaller than x, then they must be equal. You can't have same thing as well. And then the information-like properties. Uh, the first one is what I call permutation invariance, which is that you have to see these x and y's as, as distributions, for instance. And this then is a permutation of the coordinates, and you could see that as a basis transformation. And this kind of means that when we change the basis of, of how we represent the information, then the order shouldn't change. And actually, what this also means is that if you're working on a vector space model and you have this property, then your partial order lifts to a partial order on density operators. So you could also use these partial orders in the context of density operators instead of um, vector spaces. Uh, then the second property of Y is uh, mixing, which means that if X has less information than Y, then if you mix them in a convex way, then the information content will be somewhere in between. So this is kind of that it has to respect the convex nature of, uh, of the vector space um, structure. And then we also have a certain direction on these partial orders. So we require that we have a minimal element, and this minimal element, the natural choice for it is a uniform distribution. And the reason for this is that if we, uh, if we represent words as distributions, um, then if we, were if we were to have a word that had a uniform distribution, this will not give you any information at all, because it occurs in any context the same way. So for instance, a word, a possible candidate for this word in the English language would be like the, would just not add any information to you. Of course, in reality, it would not be perfectly uniform, uniformly uh, distributed yet, but it would be close enough. And then on the other hand, the maximal elements would be states that would only occur in one specific context. Because if, you, if that word appears in your sentence, then you would instantly know in which context you were working on, because it only appears in that context. So the maximum elements are the pure states. Um, and now, now you can ask, if you have these properties on, uh, on, uh, on probability distributions, what kind of partial orders can you get? Well, it turns out that if you are working on like the simplest uh, space, so the space with two points, so you have two extreme points and here from the distribution in the middle, then this gives you a unique partial order where the maximum elements are on the outside, the minimum element is in the middle, and it flows in this direction. So it's unique for NS2, but if you go to NS3, you might ask, is it still unique, because you have these, this larger space? 
And it turns out that uh, the structure that is fixed, uh, I've written that down in the form of these arrows. So you get a few of these uh, sectors, and all these sectors are um, the same in uh, how they uh, relate to each other. But you will not get a unique uh, partial order on this. So that means that if, you, if we require uh, these properties, you will not have unique notion of information content. Uh, specifically, what you could do is you can take uh, the learner order, and that is a partial order on, um, on all the positive operators. And if you restrict it to a normalized operator, so in this case the, dense, uh, the probability distributions, then this is the trivial order, so it's, uh, that you only have x mod y if x is equal to y. But you can renormalize these orders, and there are at least two different ways to do this. You can renormalize to the uh, highest coordinates, so that the high, highest coordinate is equal to 1. And then you will get uh, this partial order. And how you should read this is that um, you have a certain point x, certain point y, and that this are, these are the elements that are bigger than this element, and these are the elements that are smaller than this element. So this is the upper set, this is the downset. <coughs> you can also renormalize to the lowest eigenvalue. Um, with some caveats which I will not go into. And we've got a completely, a completely different partial order, um, where these are the elements that are higher than this element, and these are lower than these elements. Um, so, in fact, these are so different that there are points where they contradict each other. So, if we require these properties to form an information order, these are not strict enough to get a unique idea of information uh, direction. Um, so you might wonder, okay, uh, can we do something else, something require something extra that makes this direction of information content unique? And that is possible. Um, it's a condition I call the degeneracy condition. And um, what it kind of does is we have these uh, sectors, and um, these lines correspond to uh, distributions which have, a, which have a degenerated spectrum, where two elements um, have the same value. And if you require that these elements are below the other, man, or other elements in here, then what you actually get is that the partial orders will be restricted within these sectors. Um, and uh, when you do that, then you do get a unique notion of information content. And in fact, you can... Uh, sorry, sorry, does yeah. that mean you can't do that lowest eigenvalue? Uh, no, these, are, these do not satisfy those conditions, oh, right, because okay. they cross boundaries here, okay. which you can see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what you get if you do this, you do get a unique notion of information content, and you will have a family of about order n squared three parameters that you can choose for your partial order. So it's still not a unique partial order, but the direction of information content is unique. And in fact, this space of these partial orders is a complete lattice, which means that there is a maximal uh, element and minimal element, so a maximal comparison function and a minimal comparison function. And I hope these images are big enough to see, uh, but if you... Um, if you do this, then the minimal order will have uh, uh, will have these upper sets and down sets, and maximum order of this. And I draw also draw here the Bayesian order, which is an order that uh, Bob found, which is kind of the answer to the question of try to find a partial order on distributions. This was his answer. Um, okay, so uh, we have now a unique uh, direction of information content and a set of partial orders that we use for this. Um, Furthermore, all these uh, partial orders also don't contradict with any of the uh, with, with the renormalized learner order, so you can choose any of those as an extension of these. Um, and that's useful because these restricted information orders might prove too restrictive, in the sense that when comparisons are um, restricted within these sectors, these the amount of sectors scales with the um, um, I've got the English word for it, um, like n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. Factorial of n. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it, it scales with the factorial of n. So when you're working in an empirical language model, you usually have n like at least 2,000 or something. So you have much more sectors than there are words. So each word will probably be in its own sector, which makes the comparisons kind of hard to do. So um, what you could try to do is, there is a natural way on these partial orders to define grading so that you will get um, a graded uh, entitlement relation. And you can also use some smoothing operations or um, the way these partial orders are built is you have um, like n different inequalities and you could uh, say that, you, or you're only, that your measure of grading is how many inequalities you satisfy. So then you will get something that's much more general and might be able to be used for, um, for entitlement relations and stuff. Um, 
Okay. So uh, to summarize this kind of, um, there is an analog between disambiguation and information content. Um, we have a large selection of possible uh, partial orders that we could use to encode this relation. Um, but I haven't looked at like the empirical side of this. So it might be that this <coughs> might prove too restrictive or that, it, that it's not useful at all. Or it might prove that it's very powerful. Um, and I also haven't looked in detail yet at, at compositionality. So uh, what Bob talked about is, is you can compose words with, uh, using, um, using a tensor products. Uh, in general, these restricted information orders uh, don't work nicely with this tensor product. But renormalized learner orders uh, do uh, work nicely with that. So they might prove to be natural candidates for such a relation uh, as well. Um, okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to say. I'm not sure how much time we have left now. Uh, we have some time for questions. Have okay. you finished? Or? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> So if you if you apply this to density matrices, you would basically basically be taking the diagonal as a distribution um, because this is with distribution. Yeah, for the restricted information orders, you would uh, require that they are that they are diagonalizable on the same basis. Mm. So that's very restrictive as well. The renormalized learner orders you can actually do at the level of density operators. So then you get something more general. Um, I've looked at that already, but it wasn't d done yet in time for this paper. But you do get some very nice uh, structure when you use those partial orders. All right. Yeah. Just rang the bell with with uh, one of the last talks in the in the in the conference by Ogawa, I think his name. Okay. Where he was no. he was oh yeah sorry, um, he was he was computing the probability that one operator is is bigger than the other. Mm -hmm. So in spite of you know the 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 lattice of operators being so weird. He would be able to compute these probabilities that behave rather well. Okay. Uh, I, have, I haven't seen the talk, so. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> just with, yeah. Any other question? Yes. Uh, there was some, some mention earlier of other ways of comparing probability distributions, like KL divergence and that kind of thing. Do, yeah. do, do they satisfy these? Um, well, uh, the idea with KL divergence is that um, if the span is included in another factor, then the KL divergence is. Um, is not infinite, it's a finite value. And um, so from that you can define another measure which, uh, so you can rescale the scale of divergence between a number between zero and one. And the idea of these partial orders is they are comparable with it in the sense that if you have um, uh, x more than y with these partial orders, then the scale of divergence will be um, finite, will be between zero and one if you rescale it. So um, it, it's sort of related in that sense, yes. Yeah, that, that's what I was talking about, about this rescaling. Is it the same then? Uh, well, that's not a true partial order, and these are partial orders, so they are not the same. Um, but uh, as I said, like, the relation between them is that this, this representativeness is non-zero if we have this, uh, this relation. So that, that's the only thing that you can say about it. Um, well, uh, these are partial orders, so the number you would get is, is a 1 if they are comparable and a 0 if they are not comparable. Oh, okay. So you, c you can define grading, but that will in general be a completely different measure than KL divergence. So my hope is that the fact that you have a lot of free parameters in this model is that you can find something that suits your uh, need in that sense. <coughs> uh, this is one of those sort of conference cheats. I know I'm supposed to ask questions, so this is a request that I'm going to phrase as a question. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, sort of in the spirit of uh, test early, test often, what's your shortest path to empirically producing a list of pairs of words that <coughs> this model would predict one entails the other? Um, well, as I said, um, without any grading, I don't expect in a large empirical model that, this, um, that you would get a lot of comparisons. Um, <coughs> sorry, that's right. <coughs> um, the other sense, I think, I think you could set up something pretty quickly, um, because as I said, how these partial orders work is you actually get um, like n different comparisons, 
And what you can do is you can, of course, so there are some papers that, that try to define a general idea of what a good uh, idea is for, um, for uh, entailment. And they get the idea that uh, the, the, the head of distribution is more important than the tail and uh, some other properties. And you could use those things to say, okay, I only care about um, the inequalities referring to the head of the, head of the, of, of the of distribution. And then you could just uh, not use the other ones. So then you get something more general, and you could just vary the amount of, uh, of uh, inequalities you require to see what works best. So I think you could do that rather quickly. Yeah. Um, I also have a question. So you presented these two versions of the loaner, uh, yeah. loaner yeah. Uh, So are there any, do you have in your mind any linguistic intuitions for those? I mean, do you um, have some, well, some task that each one of them will be more appropriate than the other? Um, well, the idea kind of is, is that uh, when we normalize to the highest eigenvalue, then um, you, uh, there is something called uh, a measurement, and um, this is the idea that uh, there is a strict monotonic map to the real numbers. And for the um, for the highest the, the highest eigenvalue we normalize, the measurement is to the uh, to the highest eigenvalue. So that means that it has to do with uh, the the head of distribution. Well, the lowest uh, eigenvalue order has a measurement to do with the tail of the distribution. Okay. So I'd say that the high, highest eigenvalue normalizer would be more useful in the context of... Um, yes, of, uh, yes. Um, it's like um, <coughs> what I'm actually told, a tall method for putting uh, more weight to, to the highest values, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, Kotterman and Tarnhofer, they put more weight on the highest values of the future vectors, so yeah. it will be something similar. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's thank John. Uh, <laughs> lunch, lunch break, right? Lunch, yeah. Oh,